Hello, Adab, Namaste. I am Manoj Singh. On behalf of DC South Asian Arts Council, Inc., a not for profit 501c3 organization, thank you for attending the first DC South Asian Literary Festival. Thank you to all the hosts, moderators, guest speakers for your time and participation. Thank you to our team who worked long hours to put this festival together. Before we start today's last session, first let us take a moment to express our support and concern for the tough times everyone is going through due to the COVID pandemic. Our prayers and thoughts are with you. Stay safe and please take good care of yourself. After the festival, we will be sending out a short survey for the feedback. Please take the time to respond. Your feedback will help us improve our programming and audience experience. Tonight's moderator for the closing night session with well-known author Vikram Chandra is Mimi Mondal. Mimi Mondal was a Nebula Award finalist in 2020 for her novel, His Footsteps. Through Darkness and Light, and a Locus Award winner and Hugo and British Fantasy Awards finalist in 2018 for her anthology, Luminous Threads, Connections to an Octavia E. Bartleton to 2018. Mimi grew up in Col Calcutta and currently lives in New York. Here's his Mimi. Thank you so much, Mr. Singh, for the introduction. And I also want to thank you with the audience for organizing this festival. So everybody who doesn't know, hasn't met Mr. Singh, he is the main organizer of the DC South Asian Literary Festival. And he's been working relentlessly for the last few months with a huge team of um, volunteers and workers to put together this festival. And thank you so much for doing that. Um, so hi everyone, friends, listeners, well-wishers. We have finally arrived at the closing conversation of the first South Asian DC South Asian Literature Festival. It has been both our joy and a tremendous emotional strain to be holding a literary festival in the midst of perhaps the worst COVID outbreak so far happening in India right now. Um, thank you for staying with us through this week. And I hope we have been able to bring you some entertainment and respite. Um, yet again, I want to take a moment to commemorate all the pain and loss we have suffered through this year and the way we have held each other in support and in community. There is a fundraiser for prov providing COVID-19 relief on the website of DC South Asian Arts Council. Um, we would encourage you to donate if you're able. As most of us are immigrants to this country, still grappling with the wounds and complexities of our own colonial history, we also need to acknowledge that the United States of America is a settler colonial nation built upon land that was forcefully taken from its original inhabitants, the Native American people. So I am conducting this con conversation from New York City, which exists upon the land of the Lenny Lenape people. And Washington DC, from where this festival is organized, exists on the ancestral land of the Nakhotchtank people. With that, today's conversation is about South Asian literature in the United States. And I will be in conversation with author Vikram Chandra, who probably most of you know. So Vikram Chandra's latest book is Geek Sublime, The Beauty of Code, The Code of Beauty. He has also written the novel Sacred Games, which was adopted into um, an award-winning Netflix series and Red Earth and Pouring Rain and the short story collection Love and Longing in Bombay. His honors include a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Commonwealth Writers' Prize for Eurasia, the Crossword Prize, and the Salon Book Award. He teaches creative writing at the University of California, Berkeley. His work has been translated into 20 languages. Chandra is the co-founder and CEO of Granthika, which is at granthika.co, a software startup dedicated to reinventing writing and reading for the digital age. Thank you so much, Vikram, for making time for this event. Thank you, Mimi, and thank you, everyone in DC, for having me on. Um, <clears throat> it's very, it's, uh, uh, I wish we had been able to do this in person. My wife and I both taught at George Washington University uh, for a long time. So we lived in DC uh, on Columbia, 
uh, in Skylar, the Skylar Arms. Some of you must have walked past that building. So I'm getting intense bursts of nostalgia. And I hope I have some, you know, if I have any friends in the audience. Hi. So, so Vikram, I wanted to start with asking, like, where are you now and how are you? How's your family? Um, I'm in Bombay, actually. <clears throat> so this is my bedroom. Um, we are in Bandra uh, outside. So, uh, you know, I, I've gotten both my the shots of my vaccine and I haven't, I generally am here twice a year. <clears throat> I hadn't been able to make that trip. And then my father's 92nd birthday uh, was last week and um, he hadn't been keeping well. So uh, I, I just like, you know, uh, this whole madness started and I just said, okay, I'm going to go anyway. Um, so being here right now is very surreal. Um, it's, uh, as I think many people in the audience must have the same situation, a lot of my friends have tested positive, even more of their relatives and, and you know, uh, and friends have. Uh, we lost a couple of people from my batch in school, uh, from my middle school, high school. Uh, and then um, I had to take my dad to the hospital. Mm, like two or three days after I got here. So being in a hospital at this time was, in, it was very surreal because um, of course everyone was being careful, but this feeling of something in the air, right? You're afraid to breathe, right? Despite your masks and so forth. As you wear face shields and so forth, but you still feel unsafe. And then talking to the doctors there, they're under tremendous strain, right? And we're in Bombay where thanks to Iqbal Singh Chahal, who's a very extraordinary man. He's an IS officer uh, with complete backing by the administration. Our numbers are very low compared to the rest of the country. And still, uh, you can see in the hospitals um, because of the they've been working like this for the last year and more. Right. So they're all exhausted physically and emotionally. Uh, uh, nurses and doctors have died. So I, I know it's 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 a crazy time, uh, but Touch wood, my immediate family is all safe. Although my relatives up in UP and my friends who live there are having a very hard time. I mean, yeah, I mean, earlier today when I was thinking about this panel and what we wanted to talk about, and I mean, I mean, even when I proposed this panel, like not a panel, a conversation to uh, the festival organizers, I mean, one of my ideas was to talk about the different experience of being a South Asian writer in America as opposed to being a South Asian writer in India. And like today I was thinking about how steeply that experience and not just as a writer has diverged in the past few days. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I am in America, I got my vaccines, my family back home are not being able to get vaccines. Like there are people who have gotten like one shot and they're not getting the second shot. And it's so scary. And America has actually started opening up like two or three days back, New York City, got over the mask mandate so today i went out and there are people who are not wearing masks and they're partying and in <laughs> india it's like it's such a tremendously different experience and also i mean if we must think in literary terms which is i suppose not the priority in life right now i don't know how people will write about this period like i am very intrigued mm. in a way like once we survive of course in a few years, how people will write, like how this will in influence, especially South Asian, especially Indian fiction, because like we have not had a crisis of that this scale. I don't know. I mean, um, since yeah, the independence yeah. or something, yeah, like I haven't yeah. heard of that many people dying in anything. Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So I think, yeah, I guess, I mean, I moved to the States as an undergrad and have been going back and forth um, all the time. Um, and my work has been pretty significantly significantly rooted here, right? The, the subjects and the landscapes that I write about. So I think I'm sure like other people in the audience, it's, it's very, very hard to be there and have this feeling of helplessness, right? You can't do anything aside from raise money and, you know, um, raise sort of political awareness of why this is happening at the scale that this is happening um, and, and make some kind of protest, but it feels useless, right? Um, and that for me was another of the reasons that I wanted to come, right? Because I just felt like I needed to be on the ground. I had the opportunity. I have the privilege to be able to do this, right? Like I said, I'm in Bombay. We live in a 
like a small bubble, my family, a family and I in this immense, you know, in this very, very high level of privilege. So I can hide in here. Right. But as often happens in Indian cities, right around uh, the corner from us is a basti. Right. And those people had a I mean, what I've been thinking is that, as you all probably know, during the first wave, the people like in in, in Bombay who suffered were the people in the Bastis, right? Because mm-hmm. they're all back together. Dharavi, everyone in the world was oh, Dharavi is a, uh, you know, a, a site where a lot of this is happening. This time, I think what's happened is the complacency of the middle and upper classes has been completely shattered, right? And that's why, I mean, it's horrible what's happening now, but also I, I can see this around me that, that uh, people don't feel safe anymore, even when you're ensconced in this in this bubble of money right and and social connection and political connection um and i think that for me has been i don't know again you were talking about literary terms but we're all observers of of culture and politics and society especially writers you know because novelists fiction writers this is what we explore um every day right so I hate to use the word interesting, but it's it's been really kind of educational, perhaps, for me to see this at, at close hand, right? Um, and as for how we'll react to this, I have no idea, right? Uh, I guess it'll take a few years to react to this. Um, it also, I think, has punctured our complacency in terms of what we think of as scientific protection, right? Mm-hmm. My family, there were always these stories. My grandmother, <clears throat> my nani, who lived in a little village in, in UP, used to tell the stories of the plague sweeping across the village, right? And those always seemed exotic and far away. My my uh, husband died of Kala Azar when my mom was, um, I think, eight. Um, so so those seem to belong to another time. You know, we, we live in this, you know, cushion of safety. I think the the quickness of the vaccines has been an incredible scientific feat, but I don't think, at least for me, I'll ever feel safe again, right? Even in terms of you saying the mask mandate went off, um, in our county in near, in Oakland, the the local admin administration said, you don't have to wear masks in, in outside anymore. And I went for coffee, like just before I left, uh, sitting with a friend in the outdoors and some people walked by without wearing masks and I flinched, right? I was like, uh, it's it just has made my entire life seem fragile and and yeah i mean especially in america where there's like this huge anti-vaxxer movement right there's like this whole population who are not vaccinating and now that people are taking off masks you wouldn't know who has vaccinated and Mm -hmm. has like gone through that period and who's an anti-vaxxer so sometimes you're not even completely safe yeah Yeah. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. I, I've been, you know, talking about literary thing. I've been thinking a lot about Amitabh's novel, um, Calculate Chromosome, recently, right. right? Malaria and and the depredations of malaria and science and and ra- rationality in the face of nature, right? Um, I think that that is a book that's been coming back to me again and again um, in the last year year and a half. So yeah, so I actually wanted to start with asking you, like you've been an author in both India and the United States, like you've had audiences in both of these and how has your experiences as an author been different in these two countries? And I intentionally kept the question vague because I wanted to see. Right, so the the first thing that um, occurs to me I mean, I was part of that first wave of global recognition, if you want to call it that, call mm-hmm. it that, of writing. In, yeah, definitely, in, definitely, yeah. And I think that was an extraordinary moment because before that, you felt like your work was important, both in political terms uh, or you know, literary terms and to yourself, obviously, as a writer. But that sudden wave of attention was both gratifying and scary right and and also because of the kind of backlash that it caused in india right there was this whole mode of criticism of literary criticism and theory that critiqued us as selling out to the west right i mean i i i can experience like i am in a smaller scale experiencing that for indian science fiction fantasy right now because indian science fiction fantasy was not really on a global scale earlier so yeah it's it's pretty much like if i 
like do you want me to spout that history for the audience because this yeah, was probably yeah, this um possibly started like around the 1980s mid 1980s because um before that there were some indian authors writing novels as well but they were largely publishing through the through the uk through london mm -hmm. and that also just gave them like that that also put them in a very strong bubble of privilege because this is before the internet before you know mm -hmm. india opening up economically to the world so these authors were clearly only the people who had like contacts or like abroad and so on right and uh in the 1980s like a couple of things that happened for indian literary fiction was one of them was salman rushdi and arunati roy they got like the booker so like you know suddenly the international world started seeing that there was like a body of literary fiction happening from india and also penguin india started in 1987 so probably mm -hmm. also in that same wave so all these like international publishers started opening their offices in delhi which basically mm -hmm. meant that over those last few years there were like right after 1987 there was a lot more opening for authors from india who did not have foreign friends foreign family also be able to write novels and start writing and th that that was like the first wave is always big and scary yeah. like, you, you you don't know anybody whose footsteps you can follow right yeah yeah i mean and so uh, there was that and you know the the amount of attention of global attention that we got in that like i was saying um gratifying frightening and mysterious right and so so i mean it was this the levels at which this happened so there was that famous issue of the new yorker right in which they called us all to london uh to take a photograph right and so suddenly and like what what was interesting about that is that because we live scattered around the world in different parts of India, many of us had never met each other, right? So right, this was right, right. the era of the literary festival, right? So we all kind of, you know, and then like you're saying, I mean, I was kind of pioneer in the literary community. I put my email address, I want to put my email address in the book and my British publisher was, no, don't do that. That's so weird, you, you get hate mail. And I was used to the internet of the tech people, right? Where, right, right, right. You know, and where that was kind of considered ordinary. The innocent um, so internet. Now, we we yes. remember our generation kind kind of remembers the innocent internet. Kids yeah. now don't. Yeah, exactly. So we all show up in London, and then and then we meet each other. Many of us for the first time. I mean, literally, when they take us to this London studio for that shot, right? And and being writers, <laughs> of course, it turned out that there was like intrigue, and you know gossip to be exchanged at lunch and then i i don't want to name the people but somebody had written a bad review of somebody else right and that became explicit during the thing and there was a little quarrel right as we we're standing on those risers to take the picture right and it was both fun i mean i have to say that like writerly gossip literally gossip and literary uh, rivalry i guess like any other industry uh is is kind of you know it's part of the landscape you can't get around it uh so then suddenly you're in the new yorker for god's sake right this magazine that growing up we had all seen as this kind of literary bastion where the best writers in the world publish uh so it was it was tremendous right and i think like any other kind of wave of publicity oh and i should say also the money was a big deal right because vikram vikram said made this like million dollar deal for suitable boy and I think inevitably and correctly that was questioned. There was these incredible writers in the regional languages, um, older writers than us that had been working in English. Uh, so why is this happening? And therefore the question of why is the West paying so much money for this? Have you sold out? Are you packaging India and Indian culture and history in an, as a kind of exotica, right? So I think that thread of theory and criticism has muted over the years, but occasionally it pops right back up, right? Somebody will write a paper or an article. And, and I, you know, I think we need to question all of this, but for both of, uh, for all of us who are in the middle of it, just kind of doing our work, right? I mean, I was writing Love and Longing in Bombay that had just been published. I had started working on Sacred Games. My life and my writing life had nothing to do with all of this, right? I, I felt like 
I'm working here at my desk, wherever I am in Bombay and in DC and Houston at the time. And then this, this whole mass movement happens around you and you can't help but being caught up in it. What are you going to do, right? So, and, and I remember, I mean, this was the period I was probably in high school, middle school, high school, college, and I was probably part of the first generation of, say, English graduates from India who had like a post-colonial literature or Indian literature in English course in our syllabi, because before that there was not much Indian literature in English. I mean, because it's not just one or two books. It's also like, you know, a praxis collects only when there are several mm -hmm. works that can like speak to each other, even if they're not speaking, like the authors don't know each other. And um, so I remember some of these deba debates because although I was not in the literary community per se, I was at college, so professors and other academics were talking about it. And I think like even the language, the language takes some time to congeal, right? Yeah. Because yeah. that whole thing about like, are you exoticizing India or South Asia for the West, like are you catering in their language, right? And that is something I face now, like a decade later as a writer as well, because when I'm writing science fiction fantasy based in India, but I'm still writing in a mode that's Western. Yeah, and so yeah. I have like this one funny experience. I was um, a copy editor at Penguin India, mm -hmm. Penguin Random House India for about a year. Mm, and that year, we were doing a reissue of Bikram Seth's um, A Suitable Boy. So mm -hmm. it was a 25 year reissue. And eventually that didn't come out from Penguin. Like eventually that came out from Aleph. But that year we were doing a reissue. And because it was a really big book, it was divided among all the copy editors in the department. So everybody got like a little section. Mm -hmm. And we, we all like kept comparing what we are doing. And one of the things we were doing in the reissue was basically where he had dis described an Indian word, like a roti or a chapati or a pan, and he yeah, writes yeah. pan and he then describes what a pan is. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. we were taking those out. So that mm -hmm. was the consensus that on the 25 year edition of this book, they're talking about like at this point, we're talking about we've reached a point yeah, where yeah. we don't need to describe these things anymore. Yeah, but you can yeah. also see that in the early generation when like Indian literature is being read in the West for the first time, the Western reader doesn't know these terms. Like, or, or we don't know if the Western reader knows these terms, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, I, mean, I think what you did there was very necessary <clears throat> and very correct. I mean, I've always had a chip on my shoulder about this, right? Like, why should you translate, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, and I think it's also a matter of, like you're saying, of the language congealing in English Indian, um, and and uh, a certain level of confidence, right? Um, that that you you know, like I, when I was growing up, I used to read like many people from our generation, Enid Blyton, right, and and uh, <clears throat> American novels, right, a lot of them, um, and you know, when you're sitting in India. Uh, what is a 7-Eleven? I had no idea what that was the first time I came across it, right? And like, I had no idea like a context and, you know, there's a whole like sort of social and and um, history and, and significance, you know, when you write something like she went to the 7-Eleven, in my head, I couldn't see what that was, right? I didn't know how to interpret it. Uh, reading Enid Blyton, like there was, they were always, the characters were always eating this food that they loved. Oh, yes. <laughs> why are you, are you eating clotted cream like what the hell is that right and then like uh what were the other ones um the, 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 all these names i didn't know so the first time that i actually visited london was in a literary way when my first novel was going to be published and that whole time starting with breakfast the first morning in the hotel i started ordering all those things right that i had thought were you about. disappointed were some of them just disappointing <laughs> yeah 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 i mean you know, I can't even remember what what those were. Do you remember what they were eating in those books? Like, uh, very British things, right? I mean, I, kind of, I have a vague sense. I mean, I remember cucumber sandwiches being a thing, and I have not gotten over it. Like, yes. how can cucumber sandwich be a delicacy? I don't get it. And a fancy one, right? You go to, a, like, a snooty tea party, and then they serve, like, 
you know, it's a little slice of cucumber on like bread. It's like pav bhaji is a lot better than this. They cut the sides of it, put butter and cucumber inside, and <laughs> no. So I mean, no. One of the other things that I was thinking of also is, uh, a co- like for this panel, like we were, we had an earlier panel. Like since you're the closing panel, you you're getting to hear everything that I heard at the earlier panels, and uh, we had a panel about debut authors, and there were three authors, three South Asian authors who had all debuted, like written their first novels from the United States, and they were. As far as I know, they are all like second generation Americans. So they had not lived in India or the other countries, right? South Asia, Sri Lanka. Um, and this is a thing that's come up, like, you know, the authors were talking about, and this is not the first time I've heard about it, that publishing South Asian fiction right from the United States, because these people don't have a background in South Asia. so. They're probably not sending their novels to Delhi, right? And they're probably also writing about Americans who are completely here. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so American publishing houses until like maybe six or seven years ago, according to these authors, um, didn't really take South Asian, like they didn't really take immigrant fiction. And yeah, yeah. Uh, if they did take it, like they would do that very Highlander thing of like, we have one of each. So yeah, if there's yeah, yeah. like one Indian American author, they would be like, that's enough. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that would set them against each other. Yeah. And yeah. sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. That that probably still continues. Like in, in the South science fiction community, I have seen that continue because people are like, you know, we will take one of each immigrant community. <laughs> yeah, no, that's absolutely right, right? So I hear this from you know my friends who are Chinese American or you know, whatever it is, like you get to in a like you're saying, in an attempt to introduce seeming diversity, right, in a collection, uh, they'll be carefully picked representatives, right? And, you know, that happens on, on you know, if you go to a Silicon Valley panel now, right, they know that they're being watched carefully. And so there's one of each have, color? There's one of each color. There's like a set number of women in, in rep, you know, in proportion to the size of the panel, right? So if it's like eight people, like two will be women or three, but you know, so I, I, again, I think, I hope this is part of some kind of changing moment so that in the future, you, you, I mean, people are aware of this, but you don't get chosen to represent an entire culture, right? Because that burden, I think can be really hard on writers, right? Like this kind of, you know, if I, I have to represent whatever subculture or culture that I come from. I have to show them as, you know, good people in quotation marks. I have to depict a certain kind of um, <clears throat> political problem, right? And so, how do you do that, right? It, it, and I think if if that becomes just ordinary, so like you have a, a bunch of characters, and <clears throat> some of them happen to be from whatever ethnicity or gender, I think that is to me is like a perhaps a, an unachievable future paradise, right? Where where these these oppressions and these questions, I don't know, to some degree have been solved. But even as I say this, I'm recognizing how ridiculous that would be, right? Um, and, and especially in terms of hierarchy and access, right? I mean, the New York publishing establishment is still as far as i can see it's white it's a lot of it is east coast a lot of it is based in private liberal arts colleges right and the big ivy leagues so you get this collection of people who belong to that culture who are familiar with it even from their parents right um and and so that i guess if that changes over the medium long term i don't see it changing like next year or in the next four years, right? I mean, but that, that's that was actually one of my, like that leads to one of the questions that I had. Um, so one of the things that I saw in America, and I have only been in America like six or seven years. So I saw that like the American literary fiction or poetry or nonfiction, like pretty much the entire creative writing community is very closely attached to like the MFA degrees that come out of like certain universities. And it's basically, um, so the MFAs, 
you know, people do these master's degrees. There are hundreds of students are coming out of those every year. And I mean, like, obviously, there are master's degrees at universities. So people, a large number of them are paying money for them. And mm -hmm. even the ones who are not, who are scholarship, but they're still spending time of their lives. They're like go going away from their job or something. So it's a significant event in your life, which not many other people can afford, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and then some of these people also, like once they publish their books, they also get absorbed back in the MFA economy. So they come back as professors in the economy. And how impenetrable do you think that is because i mean you also teach creative writing right so you know that academia a little bit and you did an mfa i think from johns hopkins i did too i did, too. I did johns hopkins and the university of houston okay so so would you think like you know when i especially think of the south asian diaspora in this country um not many of them come from literary backgrounds like especially if you think of people who are second generation um a lot of their families came in as like doctors engineers you know um probably business people who did some business and literature is not a subject that's encouraged and not many people are encouraged to go into an mfa so so do you think that causes a significant hindrance to south asian americans writing mainstream fiction because i i've seen the mfa networks like i actually did one but so I, I saw the MFA networks are so tremendously insular and like the magazines that they publish short fiction in and like you, you slowly accumulate accolades mm -hmm. to get like a big book deal. You can't just come out of nowhere and get a big book deal. And those accolades require you to be from an MFA, which already cost like thousands of dollars. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so in terms of cost, I think that's, a major thing when I tell, you know, um, <clears throat> my undergrad students, when they start getting close to graduation, many of them will show up and talk to me about, should I do an MFA or not? And the first thing I say to them is don't pay for it, right? Try. I think I got the same advice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and because, you know, in just in practical terms, I mean, I guess if you're getting some other kind of degree, like if you're doing one in medicine or if you're doing one in computer science nowadays where I live or anywhere, I guess, uh, <clears throat> then you have a chance of actually paying back those hefty student loans, right? Um, but, and there are some uh, fully funded um, uh, MFA programs, right? Uh, and so two things I tell them, don't pay for it. And if you have a job, that gives you flexibility and that pays like above minimum wage. If you have any sort of skills that take you in that direction, please, please take advantage of that. So what happened to me was that I went to my first MFA with a pretty hefty fellowship. And then the second one, the same thing, luckily for me, that happened. And then by that time, I had developed an amateur interest in computer programming. And so I worked for like medium-sized companies in the Houston area doing, you know, as a consultant and programmer. And I ended up making a, you know, a quite comfortable um, living in relation to all my friends who were going out and teaching in high schools and stuff, right? Or taking like waiters, waiter jobs. So <clears throat> I think that's the first part of the advice that I give. Like you're saying, I mean, I think it is, it's a major pipeline into the publishing industry and that's exactly what happened to me i got to work with two amazing writers john barth and donald barthelme like kind of two giants of american literature um, and then uh, both of them were incredibly generous to me both in terms of their work with me but uh, don for instance uh, introduced me to his agent uh, who is like you know kind of legendary agent lynn nesbitt uh, and then eric simonoff who was then quote unquote a baby agent in that company took me on and I've been with Eric ever since. Uh, and so my movement, and then here I had got to meet David Davida at Penguin, mm -hmm. right? Independently of all of this, right? So, so I think, I think that in any case, you have to do that in some way, right? Although we should talk about alternative publishing methods, right? Um, so, <clears throat> If you can, what the MFA program does, 
the advantages that I tell my students about is that you get two or three years to spend your life focusing on your work. Um, if you're lucky, you get good teachers who are willing to give you their time. And then best of all, for what happened to me, most of my learning, I mean, a lot of my learning was in bars late at night, hanging out with other people who were obsessed with the same things I was, who were like me, right? Because they were, they were, you know, the writer personality in general terms, you know, they were like me. And so I didn't have to explain to them my life. And then we would talk about writing and literature, right? Um, and so, you know, I think it's a win-loss situation. Like you were saying, kind of class issues, right, are also part of that whole politics. I was writing Red Earth at the, um, <clears throat> and Pouring Rain at the time, which is large and dramatic, right? And, right, right, right. And, and like also the storyline kind of makes sense. Yes. And then the in the 90s, when 80s and 90s, when I was doing this, the prevailing high literary mode in American literature was minimalism, right? So Anne Beatty, Raymond Carver. So right. The, right. I took my work into class in Houston. People were, I could see they were baffled. And then I got some like editorial notes that basically said, you know, you know, you need to like bring bring this down, right? Don't have people saying large dramatic things, right? And and so you have to learn to like defend yourself against that and choose the readers for you that that produce the best results for you as a writer, right? Um, I have to say also in terms of this insularity, I'm lucky to teach at Berkeley, right? Where I have a very diverse body of students, right? And many of them are first generation college students. They write about experiences that are not like somebody who's from the East Coast, right? From Connecticut and writes about. And so that exchange in the workshops is really interesting and productive. So, I mean, yeah, I, I wanted to ask about your students. So, I mean, of all the things that you've said, let me, um, there, there were two points that I wanted to ask about already. So let me start with um, the fact that you said that you worked in like a like computer, you know, co companies with code right. because I was very excited when your book uh, Geek Sublime came out and uh, I first encountered it in the Indian edition. So the manuscript, it was called Mirrored Mind. Um, yes. And I had not seen like back then I was back in India, so uh, I wasn't reading, I guess, a lot of contemporary international work either. And I was like completely blown away by like a literary fiction writer writing about science, because mm -hmm. especially in India, it's like there's so much division between the two. And those of us who study the humanities like are so violently excluded from mm -hmm. wanting to talk about science, right? And I mean, eventually in the last, like the years after that, I moved towards writing science fiction, right? But before that, and when I was younger, I I didn't feel I had the right to study science fiction, like talk about science fiction because I was not a science student, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And and so like that book was like very, like that kind of interdisciplinary, you know, history of science kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I wanted to talk about your experience of writing the book and also how you've moved on from that book. So that, that that's your latest book, right? And uh, you have a company called Granthika, which is uh, an organization that like it's an app, right? And it helps authors, emerging yeah. authors yeah. write fiction. So this is once again, like um, a coming together of literature and technology. So I, I, I wanted to talk about that intersection of literature and technology, which is like these days it's become like a very hot topic. Lots of yeah. people are talking about it, but I, I feel like, you know, that your book was a long time before I heard a lot of other people talking about it. Right. So um, so I should say to the audience, Mimi's, what Mimi is not telling you is that she was extremely helpful to me in in constructing that book. I didn't actually, when we first met, I didn't actually know, I remember that, and for which I'm sorry. And especially with one section of the book, there's a poem uh, in in kind of uh, pre, I mean, recent Bengali, which many of my Bengali friends didn't even understand. So that was amazing <laughs> for you to do. Yeah, so, it's 
big Bengali Sanskrit. And yeah, yeah. Th- th- that is something I grew up reading, but I, I never thought it was a big deal. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so again, like for me, that book came about, uh, as I guess all books do, um, from a personal interest and obsession of mine, right? So I, like I was saying, uh, as a as a grad student, I started to really get interested in um, programming in, uh, in in a amateur fashion, right? I've never uh, taken a computer science class, although I've tried to teach myself um, some things about it. So what I was fascinated by was the culture of programmers, right? Which is like all our lives are affected so much by technology now, right? And especially coming from this aspect of the tech world. Um, that I felt like not many people from outside knew about. Um, and and so my initial attempt was to, I had been working on fiction. I kind of got stuck on fiction, not in that horrible writer's block kind of way, but I just didn't know what was going to happen next. So I thought, okay, I'll write it like a 20 pager essay and try and talk about like the culture of programming. And then from that, you know, I just, just grew and, and it kept getting longer and longer. It kept bringing in more subjects like pre-modern um, Indian work in linguistics, going back all the way to Parnini, um, uh, Indian aesthetic theory, which I've always been fascinated and by and, and had read up a lot about. Uh, and so tr- the, the attempt was to do all of these things together. And at some point, you know, I, I would give drafts of it to my wife, Melanie, and she said, uh, one day you realize this is not an essay, it's a book, right? Which was both a kind of like really exciting moment and scary, right? Because like, damn, I have to spend my, and I tend to publish a book every 10 years. I'm really slow, right? And I spend a lot of time on what I call research, but I think it's just sometimes I feel like it's an excuse to avoid the act of writing itself. Yeah, right? I don't think I'm the person who should call you out on that. <laughs> yes, really? You do that too? I write like a short story in two years, so yeah. No. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it was a happy sort of coming together of many of my interests, uh, and and in a way that I hope was productive for the readers, both in terms of like informative ways, right? Like just things that people might not know about. But as always, like you want to give your readers pleasure and try and construct something that you think is beautiful. Right at the kind of like the limits of your abilities, um, and so that was a weird detour for me. I had never written nonfiction, and I'd always felt like that was not my craft. Right, it was not my. It didn't exist in my muscle, and it was using a different form. Uh, and what I mean by that is, it it's written in these very short sections. Right, right, like right of course, yeah. These kind of like little sections of maybe two pages, and then another section which is completely about something else, right? And bringing that together. Um, So I learned a lot from writing that book, although right now what I'm working on is not at all non-fiction-y, right? It's, it's, I'm, this is actually the the project I was working on before um, that I wrote Geek Sublime and I came back to it. Uh, So yeah, so it's an, like I was saying, it's a bringing together of like, three of the interests that I've had for decades, right? So pre-modern Indian aesthetics, programming, and, and culture as in the culture of programming, right? So, um, so what are you writing right now? Like, are you free to talk about it? Well, I'm very superstitious, as many writers are, about talking about current work, right? Because it seems... No, totally understand, too. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what I will say that it's, again, a, Formally, it's a kind of really weird new thing that I'm trying to do. It's three novellas set in three different cities at different points in time. So the working title is Three Cities. So they will eventually stay as three novellas, right? Because one of the one of the things I have seen my agent, and not just my agent, but like other authors advise me to do. So I write short pieces usually. I have never written a novel. And I have been told that why don't you write like several short pieces and like put them together because a novel is a more saleable format. I, 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 a friend of mine, Akash Kapoor, actually told me like last month, he said, like, damn it, don't call it novellas put together. Yeah, Say I edited Akash Kapoor's book too in that that year at Penguin. Oh, really? 
Yeah. yeah. So and then, then wasn't in touch with him. Oh, I see. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So he, his point was just don't label it as something else, package it as something else. It's a novel in three parts, right? Which it really is, right? Which it really is. But in my head, it's a triptych, right? I'm trying to do this formally, this thing where, where the stories thematically work together, but in plot terms and so forth, it's they're not so connected. So I like since you said that you know you write a book in ten years, um, does it also mean that like um, you're in a tremendously different headspace from book to book? Like most of your your older older fiction is also like they're not really very much like each other. You know, yeah. like you know, Sacred Games is not very much like Red Earth, and then yeah. Love and Longing in Bombay short stories. So I mean, do you think? Because you take a pretty long time writing another book, like do you move into a different phase of life or different phase of your intellectual life? Not yeah, so. yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, and for me, that's I, I'm not saying that any other way to work is a lesser way, but mm -hmm. that's one of the things that drives me to the next book, right? Because it feels the new, it feels um like I don't know what I'm doing. <clears throat> the landscapes that I'm writing about are things that are new to me as well. So that that curiosity about all of those things um, leads forward into this long period of immersion, right? And when I come out uh, of these, I feel like I don't want to deal with them again, right? So at least for a while. <clears throat> so writing after Sacred Games, um, I mean, coming out of Sacred Games after it was published, I'd spent 10 years immersed in politics, violence, like extreme violence, especially in the <laughs> Ganesh Gaitonde, right? And I realized after writing that, after getting that uh, gap time, right, that downtime, how much that had messed up my head, right? Uh, and so I never wanted to hear about gangsters. For a long time, I didn't want to read about gangsters again, right, or uh, international intrigue you know, where people are killing each other. And then like the TV series came about and <laughs> that was an interesting experience because it plunged me right back into, into Right, that. right, right. I, I was wondering about that because there was quite a significant gap between the publication yeah, and yeah. then like the adaptation of it. Yeah. So um, I'm looking at a lot of questions. So we, oh. we should start the Q&A section. Um, yes. Great. So one of the questions is like it, carries over from what I was just asking. Um, the question is, Sacred Games was adapted for a TV series by Netflix. Were you satisfied with the outcome? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was brilliant, right? And so I've worked a little bit in film and before that. Uh, so one of the things that I understand is that there's nothing more irritating to filmmakers than a novelist who tries to control and is always bugging them because the the film version is not like the the novel version, right? And so I was very ready once the you know once we had fixed up like everything and this group the writers' room had gotten together in Bombay, I just like let, tried as hard as I could to let go of it, right? And I told them do whatever the hell you want, just you know send me drafts as we go along and I'll try and give you as much help as I can. Although there was a moment of <laughs> shock when they sent me an early draft of the pilot, right? The first episode, like I read it, and I was like, "What? Like my characters are different, right?" And Melanie read it and said, "Damn it, this is not your book." And I said, "Listen, as soon as we like um, put that first check in, in the bank account, it ceases to be your book or my book, right?" So you just have to let go. And then um, as we got further into the process, and then once it was released. It, I think they did a tremendous job of adapting a very difficult book, right? Imagine trying to put a 900 page book into two seasons with that complicated narrative structure that went back and forth. Um, there was uh, right after it went, had been published, the book got optioned by a really a, uh, <clears throat> a film company whose work I loved and respected. And at that point, I said, I don't understand how are you going to fit this book into two, even a two and a half hour film. But bless you, go and do it. And they hired a very, I mean, talented, prominent British playwright 
and film writer to do it. And it just didn't happen from as far as I could tell because nobody could ever fit do that in two hours, right? Two and a half hours. And this was like when HBO was just kind of getting off. So I think the form itself, the long form series, is much more suitable to this kind of adaptation than the old film adaptation. Right, right, right. And I, I was thinking about that as you were speaking, that I, I think the long form TV series has become a blessing for a lot of adaptations because books can't be fit into that size. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So there's another question about the Sacred Games from Netflix. It asks, how does the cult following around Netflix's Sacred Games make you feel? And do you think that takes away attention from your original novel? No, I mean, I don't think so. I mean, I think a lot more people have, like the younger generation especially, right? The 18 and the 20 years old, their attention has been drawn to the novel through the series, right? And then what's funny to me is that a lot of the uh, the people who had read the book when it first came out uh, and loved the book, like were upset with the TV series because of the changes they had made and the different kind of emotional tone, especially to Sartaj, right? And and because Gaitonde stayed the same, but there was some significant parts of Sartaj that were changed in the in the in the series. And again, to me, these are two different universes that. Um, exist at different angles to each other right so so what i was happy about is that they didn't do a kind of literal translation which always according to me ends up in disaster right it's like trying to translate poetry from one language to the other if you do a literal translation it doesn't work right you you translate the sense but you leave the poetry all behind so do you think people who came in like after watching the tv show like they came to the book later do they tend to be more loyal to the TV version? Yeah, I think so. But I mean, from what people have told me in conversation is that they actually felt like the world of the TV series was opened up in the book and <clears throat> made, in a sense, richer, right? Because there's much more space in a novel to linger, right? To, to I mean, you know, one of the things about film is that, that uh, and television is that you know, in the book, like Sartaj for the first 200 pages, 250 pages, is investigating much smaller cases. And right, right, right. The, this large kind of international intrigue is completely in the background. He spends a lot of time just stuck in traffic jams in Bombay thinking. Right? And, and so, you know, you can't do that in television, right? Especially in something that is labeled as a thriller, right? Um, and it's sold as a thriller, and the the audience comes to it expecting a thriller. Right from the first like minute, you have to be constructing external conflict. Right, right. right. You know, so that's just how it works. So I, I've gotten a lot of, um, I mean, the reaction that I've seen in terms, like I was saying, in when people talk to me, is that many of them liked it. I mean, I'm sure some of them that lingering, that sense of pace, is precisely what they didn't like. Right. I mean, that happened even when the, the book came out. I mean, Penguin especially kind of packaged it as a thriller. And that's what they were telling the general public. And like somebody who starts, who goes into it expecting like some kind of tight thriller. And then yeah, I mean, we were like, this is a really big thriller. <laughs> yes, I know. like a lingering thriller. So um, a question I have here is, how did you get the idea to create Granthika? And how is it different from Final Draft or any other writing portal? And how also, how is the response to it? Well, um, so where it came from was always my frustration with the writing tools that have been available throughout my, my writing career, right? So <clears throat> what happens is that, let's say that you're writing your manuscript in Word or Google Docs or whatever, or Final Draft. Um, all this knowledge that you accumulate while writing is scattered. So what happens to me, I accumulate a large amount of research, like secondary stuff, like you know, scholarly articles or some articles that somebody has written. I like to do with interviews with people in the field, so to speak. I take photographs. Um, and so after a couple of years, when I'm writing, you know, I'm on page 200 and I think, okay, I need to go back and reference that interview that I did two years ago. I have a hard time finding that damn thing, right? 
and there's no way to link the knowledge with with your text so that's what we've built so you can think of it kind of like as a as a writing as a place where you can write your manuscript intimately married to a database and a timeline right and managing time when you're writing fiction is incredibly hard right because you put something you know that happens in 2002 and then you want to change the date but you realize then the characters your protagonist's birth has to move up to right the parents age changes downstream events change right and then um what we've done under the surface is a kind of groundbreaking technology to implement all this we've applied for a patent so you can do things like ask questions like show me every chapter in which these two characters appear are, are active participants right not just references to them right so if you work in word now and you want to do this what you have to do is do a search right um, for the name but then what happens is that every time somebody mentions those characters those also show up as results right so i mean check it out right we have a free trial and so forth my writing mornings are much happier because of all of this because like i said i'm working in fiction uh, especially this also happened during geeks of life right because a lot of that book was research based and it was very fact based right so in fiction if you make an error the audience um is fairly forgiving, right? I've gotten emails about, you know, that train doesn't leave from that station, right? But in fiction, you make one mistake. I mean, in nonfiction, people get pissed off, right? And some scholar will write into you and, you know, in fact, that is, you know, whatever it is, this is not the case. This, you know, philosopher lived in the 12th century, not the 11th, right? And then you're like, I'm so ashamed, I'm sorry. <laughs> so so that's the idea, right? And so you can do all of these things. And we're constantly adding, like, well, well, one of the things that we've added is that you can get metrics, right? So we do the traditional word length and, and you know, uh, sentence length and so forth. But we also, like, for instance, compare your text to a corpus of already published novels and tell you the vocabulary richness, right? It's not prescriptive. It's just to tell you, Right, that your variation in words is greater than that of Hemingway, but less than Joyce. Oh, but, right, right, yeah. And, and then, then these... and then gender issues, right? What kinds of words are you attaching to different genders, right? And again, this is informative. You know, if you, are you always saying beautiful when you mention a woman character, right, as opposed to men who are depicted in some other way? And we can do that as well. No, this is great because I actually saw memes and like other search engines and other things going around about these things maybe a few years back, but there has never been like a comprehensive place yeah. where you can do all these things. Yeah. So, I mean, and when that exists, it's very geeky, right? It's very sort of, um, you know, technologists and programmers can use that. But what we've tried really hard to do is that it's for non-techies. Right, so anybody can use it in a way that makes sense in the interface. Awesome. So I have uh, another question. It's it's um, how was it growing up with sisters who are also very accomplished in their own space, Anupama and Tanuja Chandra? Was there any competition on who will get the first book deal? <laughs> <laughs> it was fine, and I should say that this all comes from my mother. Right. <clears throat> I don't know if it comes genetically. But at least like in terms of our family space, um, she's also a writer. So mm -hmm. she's written fiction, nonfiction, and then she wrote, um, had a long career in the Bombay film industry. She wrote, you know, uh, Raj Kapoor's, uh, the story for Raj Kapoor's Prem Rogue, Chandni. Um, she was involved in 1942, A Love Story. So as far back as I can remember, I remember her sitting on the dining table, writing on these long full scape, uh, full scap pieces of paper. Right. So right from the beginning, this writing kind of life was very familiar to me and also its difficulties. Right. So I used to see the checks that she used to get from Durdarshan for writing a two hour play and it was 100 rupees. Right. And you can't make a living on that. So I was like, OK, writing is a thing that I'm passionate about, <clears throat> but how the hell am I going to ever be able to do it? So I think the similar thing happened to Anu and Tanu <clears throat> is that they develop different interests. You know, uh, Tanuja has written uh, prose uh, as well, but uh, I think her main thrust is towards uh, film, 
Um, and then Anu has always been a critic. She has no interest in the, the fiction or film writing part of it, right? And so we developed, I think, in kind of parallel. And no, there hasn't been any, any competition. Um, in fact, it's rather productive, right? So when you sit at my kitchen table, at our dining table, I was there last night. So my Anu is married to Vidhu Vinod Chopra, who's a producer and director. And we were talking about a recent film release, right? And which none of us actually, <clears throat> I haven't seen it yet, but Anu saw it. Uh, you can see her review. It's off Rade. I mean, it's no big secret, right? Salman Khan's latest uh, big time Eid release, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> and so that conversation has also been tremendously productive, right? We all kind of learn from each other, although we have very different tastes, right? And some commonalities, but also different tastes. Okay, so we are running out of time. I will take one last question, which is any book recommendations that are English translations of authors or from the South Asian diaspora? Like any book recommendations in general? Oh, so I, I think, like I was saying at this time, Amitabh's uh, Calcula Chromosome is much on my mind. If you mm -hmm. haven't read it, you should read it. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of translation, Again, like I was saying, I'm in, back in Bombay after a couple of years. There's an incredible translation of Mantos. Um, he wrote a bunch of essays about his time in the film industry, right? And it's called Stars from Another Sky. And you should absolutely, if you have any interest in, in Indian film, you should read that. It's so, it's gossipy, it's funny, it's poignant. Um, and so that's something that I actually will look for in these shelves. I know it's somewhere. I want to read that again. Uh, recent books, I mean, I told Mimi before we, um, we, we, when we were planning this conversation, I'm sadly behind on contemporary Indian or South Asian writing, right? <clears throat> because uh, the last few years, because of Granthika, you know, everything you've heard about the startup life is, is like 10 times worse, right? In terms of, in terms of how much time it takes up. Uh, um, so that's taken a bunch of time. We have our kids are 11 and 13, which is another kind of like you guys know this, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Guys, happily a lot of your time. Uh, and then like there's my teaching and my writing. But especially because of this startup thing, like I, I, I like have to fight for a moment to like work on my own writing, right? And so and I'm also, you know, I'm involved in a couple of other um, television projects, projects that will hopefully see the light of day and you'll see on your screen. So it's, um, when I read, uh, also my, I, I Mimi knows this, I I'm trying to teach at this intersection of technology and, and art at Berkeley. So what a lot of what I've been reading is actually sci-fi, right? Anil Men Menon, uh, Mimi's work, uh, which I highly recommend, uh, Vandana Singh and so forth, right? So, so I, yeah, I mean, that is, it's a wonderful, it's great. You should absolutely go read it. Um, what is the Golan's collection of sci-fi called, Mimi? Yeah, um, yeah, it's called the Golan's collection of South Asian science fiction, right. South Asian speculative fiction, somewhere here in my shelves, but I think everything will tumble if I take it out. Yes, but so you should absolutely go read that, you know, whether you like science fiction or not, I think it's like you're saying, it's a wonderful moment in sci-fi. Are any of them translations? I think mm -hmm. so. Uh, some of them are translations. In the Golang's book, there are some translations from English, um, from different South Asian languages to English. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that would include also that, right? Which, I mean, I have to say, this is another wonderful thing that started happening, I think, in the 80s and 90s, that there are increasing number of translations from other languages, right? So before that, I had heard of these wonderful books in other languages, which I wanted to read. I had no access to them. Right. And so that whole thing from from, you know, Bengal, right, all these great uh, Bengali writers from the last couple of centuries who had I mean, I had no access to that. And by now, people have started saying that all Indian translations come out in like from Bengali and Malayalam largely and like <laughs> other languages also need to be given a little more attention. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, but okay, so this was actually a very great, very enlightening conversation. Thank you so much for this. And yeah, I, I hope our audiences enjoyed it. And uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the 
entire literary festival as much as we could do in these pretty dire times. Mm, thank you. Thank you, well, Vikram. Thank you, Mimi, for this wonderful conversation. Thank you also to the festival. And I hope very, very soon we'll be able to do this in real life. Right? Oh, I am looking forward to that. I am so totally looking forward to that. Thank you once again.